بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين qsep.com your step by step guide to learning islam online tauhid explained from the book aqidatu tauhid by sheikh saleh bin fauzan al fauzan presentation and explanation by dr abdullah al farsi الحمد لله وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم This is the introduction of Kitab At-Tawhid by the honorable great scholar Sheikh Saleh Al-Fawzan may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide him with a longer life and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make his life in the service of Islam and Salafiyyah. The Sheikh says in his introduction, which is a short introduction, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala nabihi al-sadiq al-ameen, nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een, proceeding. This is a book regarding the knowledge of Tawheed and I have taken into consideration the briefness and the easiness of expression and I have derived it or based it on many sources from the books of our Imams especially the books of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah and the books of his student Al-Allamah ibn Al-Qayyim and the books of Shaykh Al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abd Al-Wahhab and his students the Imams of this blessed Da'wah and there is no doubt that the knowledge of Islamic Aqeedah is the foundation knowledge the basis of knowledge that should be taken care of and considered seriously as far as learning it and teaching it and acting on its behalf so that all our actions become true and accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beneficial for those who act upon them especially that we live in a time where there are so many deviated streams and groups the stream of atheistness the stream of Sufism and the like the stream of saint worshipping Quburiya, idol worshipping the stream of innovations which opposed to the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all these are very dangerous streams and if the Muslim was not equipped with the weapon of Aqeedah the true Aqeedah which is based on the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on that which the predecessors of this nation are upon the Salaf al-Salih then one is easily subject that those false streams could take him away and seduce him therefore 
one should be extremely careful about learning the true aqidah and teaching it to the Muslims from the right sources. The first chapter is an entrance, a pre-study to the Aqidah and it composes of three chapters. The first, the meaning of Aqidah and showing its importance. The second chapter, the sources of the true Aqidah and the way of our predecessors in learning it. And the third chapter is about the deviation in Aqidah and the ways or means of avoiding such deviation. Regarding the first chapter, the Sheikh starts with defining Aqidah linguistically. And this is the way of our scholars when they define something they start by defining the word linguistically then they define it according to the religious meaning and the linguistic meaning helps a lot in understanding the legalistic or the religious meaning so that that's why they start with the linguistic meaning the linguistic meaning the sheikh says the word aqidah is taken from al-aqd which means to tie upon something to tie something firmly to believe such and such that means your heart is tying upon it strongly so this helps in understanding the importance of surety sureness in aqidah tiness is something to tie something that means you have to be very sure about it in your heart and aqidah is that which someone takes upon as a religion and there is something which is called a good aqidah which means something which is free from doubts and aqidah is an action of the heart because when we say aqidah, it doesn't simply mean that you know something. Knowing something or admitting to it is not the action of the heart. As Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah has shown in his book, Al-Iman, knowing something is the saying and the statement of the heart. But the action of the heart is beyond that to love what you know this is one action of the heart to know what you know for the sake of Allah in other words sincerity in your knowledge this is another action of the heart to be firm and sure of what you know this is another action of the heart the fact that your heart your heart feels secure about what you know. This is the action of the heart. Tuma'neena, security. Yaqeen, surety. Ikhlas, sincerity. And there are, of course, other actions of the heart, like reverence, like trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and many other actions of the heart. So aqidah is an action of the heart. So if you know something without loving it, for example, rather you might be hating it, thinking that what you know is of no use, like for example, the Christians, many of them upon arguing with them, they say, we know that this is contradictory, but we have to believe in it. In other words, since they know it is contradictory, then at least they are not sure, at least. Let alone the fact that they don't love this because it's contradictory. So actually, 
This is not a true aqidah. Not a true aqidah. And then the Sheikh defines aqidah according to the religious meaning. That is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, the day of judgment, and in the divine decree, it's good and evil, all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these six matters are called the pillars of faith. The pillars of faith. And these are mentioned in Quran and mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Unfortunately, some contemporary writers who are called Islamic thinkers, they only mention five of those as pillars of faith. And they leave behind the faith in the divine decree as if it is not a pillar of faith. And those people are affected by the deniers of Qadr, the deniers of the divine decree, which we call al qadariya Therefore, they don't even mention this pillar when they mention the pillars of faith. And the Sheikh goes on saying, the Sharia is divided into two, things to believe in which are called i'tiqadiyat and things to act upon which are called amaliyat the i'tiqadiyat are those things which do not show the details of actions such as the faith in the lordship of allah and the faith in his worship the fact that he should be worshipped alone and the rest of the pillars of faith that we mentioned. And those are called also asliyah or usul. Usul. There is no problem in saying that this religion has usul and furul. Unlike what some people understand from some statements of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah in some places said, there are no differences in usul and furul, or is something to that effect. Those people understood from this statement that there shouldn't be any classification like this. But this is not the meaning of what Shaykh al-Islam said, because Shaykh al-Islam himself uses this expression, usul and furul in many parts of his writings. But what he meant in that position, he meant that in this aspect that we are speaking about, we don't make a distinction between usul and furul, but it is not a general thing to say that there is no difference between usul and furul. So Al-Sunnah, call those pillars of faith, they call them usul al-iman. We have, for example, usul al-i'tiqad, a title of aqidah book by many scholars. We have sharh usul ahl sunnah wal jama'ah by Lalukai. So we have many books named usul. And when we speak about usul, we mean the pillars of faith and everything which is attached to them. Yani if you take usul, uh, sharh usul al-i'tiqad or usul al-i'tiqad by some scholars like Tabari and by Allah Lukai, you will find issues that Ahl sunnah wal jamaah have agreed upon and you will find maybe 50 or 60 or 70 up to 100, 110 points in those books. And it depends on what they think it is important to point out to the people in their time. For example, if you look at a very early Aqidah book, you might not find more than 10 points. Why? Because those 10 points, in those 10 points particularly, 
there happened deviations at that time. So the rest of the points, there was an agreement upon. Yani, let's say at the time of Khawarij, they did not deviate in 100 points. So if someone wrote the points of Aqidah at that time, he would write only few points, let's say 9, 10, 11, 15, whatever. So they write what is enough to guide the people in, in their time. They don't like to write a lot of talk for nothing. This is not the way of the Salaf. The way of the Salaf is to write only that which is sufficient and not go beyond that and not go into a lot of talking and writing and putting theories and putting expectations and things like that. This is not the way of the Salaf. And then the Sheikh says, regarding the Amaliyat, those things to act upon, like prayers, like zakat, like fasting, like the rest of the rulings, hajj, umrah, and so on. The sheikh says, these are far'iyya. These are, far' means branch. They are called as such because they are based on the first ones, which are the usul or the i'tiqadiyat. So because those things are based on the first ones, then they are called furu' like the branches of the tree which are based on the foundation of the tree and the root of the tree and this is mentioned in quran in surah al-kahf or in surah ibrahim alayhi salam at towards the end of surah ibrahim alayhi salam alam tara kayfa darab allah mathalan kalimatan tayyibah ka shajaratin tayyibah asluha thabit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the example of La ilaha illallah, which is the kalima tayyibah, the good word. Allah is saying that this is synonymous to a good tree. That good tree has a foundation in the ground, the roots and so on. And then it makes branches that might reach very high. Huh? depends on the kind of tree so is la ilaha illallah so is the faith so is the faith if the foundation is very strong the branches could be very very high the sheikh says the true aqidah is the foundation that the whole religion is based upon and that all actions would be accepted with it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he who wishes to meet with his Lord, let him act right actions, provided that he does not fall into setting up rivals with Allah in his worship. This is the uh, verse 110 in Surah Al-Kahf. Of course, the meaning of uh, he who wishes to meet with his Lord, meaning he who wishes to meet with his Lord while he is pleased with him. This is the meaning. And the Sheikh uses another verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and to those before you, that if you were to commit shirk, all your actions will be cancelled and you will be amongst the losers. This is verse 65, Surah Al-Zumr. And also the verse which says, Worship Allah sincerely, making all the worship for Him. The whole religion should be purely for Him. And this is verses 2 and 3, Surah Al-Zumr. So those verses, those honorable verses, and all other verses which are in the same meaning or give the same meaning and they are a lot like that in Quran show that actions will not be accepted except if they were pure from shirk and therefore the messengers were very much concerned about showing the true aqidah 
and building up the true aqeedah in their followers. So the first thing that they would call their people to is to worship Allah alone and to leave behind worshiping others and setting up rivals with Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have sent to every nation a messenger calling them to worship Allah and avoid other deities, avoid Ta'ut. Surah Al-Nahl verse 36. And every messenger says at the beginning of his talk to his people, أعبدوا الله ما لكم من إله غيره Worship Allah for you have no other deity besides him and this is Al-A'raf verses 59, 65, 73, 85 this is said for example by the prophets Nuh, Hud, Salih, Shu'ayb and the rest of the prophets may the peace of Allah and his prayers be upon them all and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed in Mecca after being sent as a Prophet for 13 years calling people to Tawheed and calling people to the right faith and Aqeedah because it is the foundation that the rest of the religion is based upon. And so did the wise callers to Islam, the wise callers to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in every time and every place they followed the path of the prophets and the messengers they were starting by calling people to Tawheed and to the true Aqeedah and then after that they go to the rest of the religion one by one and of course uh, giving priority to what is more important the second chapter in showing the sources of Aqeedah and the way of the Salaf regarding how they learn the Aqeedah. The Sheikh says, Al Aqeedah Tawqifiyya. This is very important. Tawqifiyya means Tawqifiyya is from Wukuf or Yaqif to stop. This means you have to stop with the revelation. You cannot exceed the revelation. You cannot go beyond the revelation, the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the revelation. The revelation is the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not just the book as some kafirs say and it's not also what your heart feels as some extreme Sufis claim that our heart is inspired by Allah that such and such and so on. They, they take their beliefs, they take their rulings from this false imagination that they call revelation. And indeed, it is a revelation. As Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, yeah, they are right. إِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ لَيُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضُ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا It is a revelation, but from shayateen from the devils and they think that this is a revelation from Allah and they call it kashf and ilham inspiration and revealance so al-aqeedah tawqifiyya because matters of aqeedah those six articles of faith six pillars of faith there is no room for opinion in it there is no room for opinion you cannot claim that some of those articles of faith are subject to change at a certain time or subject to ishtihad. There is no ishtihad in matters of aqeedah. Unfortunately, we have some contemporary so-called Islamic thinkers who think that everything is subject to ishtihad. And they call to ishtihad in matters of aqeedah. Like, for example, At-Turabi and many others like him who follow him. Even Sayyid Qutb, rahimahullah, he had some expressions in this regard. That he was quoted to say that I am a mujaddid in aqeedah also. A mujtahid in aqeedah 
also. And of course, this is a revelation from the devil. This has no basis in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And many so-called contemporary thinkers has fallen into this, Maududi and many others. Yani they say in the matter of Dajjal, Maududi denies it. And he says this is a superstition. Even though it is based on mutawatir hadiths. Not only agreed upon true hadiths in Bukhari and Muslim, but mutawatir. So this is something which one should be very much aware of. That aqeedah should be based solely and only on the revelation, the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is no room for ishtihad and opinion in matters of aqeedah at all. So the Sheikh says the aqeedah should not be approved except by a proof from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the legislator. A shari' means the legislator which means the revelation from Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is no room in it for opinion or ishtihad, the Sheikh says. There is no room in it for opinion or ishtihad. Therefore, the sources are limited and tied only to those two sources, the Quran and Sunnah. Because no one knows Allah and what is most fit for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what should he be glorified from? No one knows all that more than Allah himself. Who could claim that he knows about Allah, what he deserves of attributes and what he should be glorified from more than himself? So therefore, no one has the right to come and say, Allah must be glorified from having a face. Allah must be glorified from having two hands. Allah must be glorified from such and such. This is like saying, O oh Allah, I know about you and what suits you more than what you know about yourself. This is just like saying that because Allah is saying about himself he has two hands and Allah is saying he has a face and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he is merciful. So how could you come and dare and say, no Allah, these things don't suit you and I glorify you from all this. How could you say this? And this is, of course, this is actually what the innovators do. Therefore, the way of our predecessors and those who followed them in the right aqeedah, they were strictly based on following the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, narrated, said, أَجْمَعَ الْعُلَمَاء مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ إِلَى الْمَغْرِبِ عَلَى الْإِيمَانِ بِهَذِهِ الصِّفَاتِ الَّتِي جَاءَتْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَالسُنَّةِ He says, the scholars, all scholars, from east to the west, have agreed upon believing in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which have been mentioned in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And this is what Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah has said in his book Al-Fiqh Al-Absat and Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar. He approved two eyes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he approved the pleasure as an attribute of Allah, the love as an attribute of Allah, the angriness as a, an attribute of Allah, the hatred as an attribute of Allah, he approved of all those attributes. And he said, anyone who denies that Allah is up on his throne is a kafir. And then they asked him, they said, how about someone who says, I don't know whether Allah is up or not. He said, he is a kafir. So the one who denies it is a kafir and the one who doubts it is a kafir. 
And this is the aqidah of all imams. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah said, we approve of all that which Allah has approved for himself in his book. And of all that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam has described Allah in, in the sunnah. Then he said, لا نتجاوز القرآن والحديث We do not exceed the Qur'an and the Hadith. This is the meaning of the statement of the Sheikh which he said in the beginning, العقيدة توقيفية We do not exceed Qur'an and Hadith. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he started his great book, Al-Risala, by saying, الحمد لله الذي هو كما وصف نفسه في كتابه All praise be to Allah The one who is only described with that which he described himself in his book And in another quotation Imam al-Shafi'i رحمه الله said آمنت بالله وبما جاء عن الله على مراد الله وآمنت برسول الله وَبِمَا جَاءَ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ عَلَى مُرَادِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ We have faith in Allah and in all that which has been revealed to us from Allah according to what Allah meant عَلَى مُرَادِ اللَّهِ and we have faith in the Messenger of Allah and in all that which the Messenger of Allah has came with according to what the Messenger meant this is very important if you take a verse and explain it as you wish, as you wish and as you want, and then you say, I believe in this verse, you are fooling yourself. You are not believing in this verse. What kind of faith is this? Because you have not believed in the meaning of the verse. The meaning that you chose is not what Allah wanted. And if you do the same thing with the hadith, you take the hadith out of context, and then you say, I believe in this hadith. This is no faith. This is no faith at all. So as Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah said, you believe in, in what came from Allah according to what Allah meant. And you believe in what the messenger said according to what the messenger meant. And the talk of Allah, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear. It's clear. There is no need to philosophize it or use uh, all kinds of long uh, statements to explain it and logic and all that. There is no need. Very clear. Very uh, simple. Very easy. Very straightforward. Especially in matters of faith. And especially in Tawheed, which is the foundation so the Sheikh says, regarding Ahl Sunnah, whatever the book and the Sunnah says regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they believe in it, they have i'tiqad in it, and they act upon it. And what the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam denies, then they deny it also regarding what does not suit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the deficiencies. And therefore, nothing occurred or no differences occurred between them in matters of faith. So Ahl Sunnah agree. If you look at the book of Abu Zayd al-Qayrawani, who was a Maliki about Aqidah, and you look at the book of Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Fiqh al-Absat or Al-Fiqh al-Akbar, and you look at Aqid al tahawiyyah by Imam al tahawi the Hanafi. And you look at the Lum'atul I'tiqad by Ibn Qudamah, the Hanbali scholar. And you look at al Shari'ah by al Ajurri, Shafi'i scholar. All are the same thing. No differences. No differences in matters of Aqidah. They are all the same. So their Aqidah is one. And therefore, they are one group. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed for those who stick to his book and the sunnah of his messenger, that they will be one, one group. And they would have one word. 
And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the hypocrites, you think of them as one, while the truth is that they are many in hearts. Therefore, they are not one. They look to you as one. Let's say X group. Huh? They claim to be united and they are one. But you find in this group, this person follows the Mu'tazila. And this, this one follows the Ash'ariyya. And he follows the Sufiyya. And he follows the Khawarij. And he follows the Murji'a. And he follows the Shia. And he follows such and such. Then you know that they are not one. Even though they claim to be one, they are not one. To be one, you have to be united in Aqeedah. This is the point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when Allah called us to unity and ordered us to unite, he did not say just unite. He said, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا huh? Stick all together to the rope of Allah, which is his book, and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the fundamentals which are in it. Stick to that to be united. وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا So there is no unity without sticking to the fundamentals of faith and iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, if there comes to you from me a guidance, then follow my guidance. Because he who follows my guidance, then he would not go astray and he would not be miserable. Verse 23, Surah Taha. That's why Ahl Sunnah are called the saved group, Al Firqatun Najiyah. The Prophet وسلم, testified for them that they will be saved when he said that this nation will divide into 73 groups, all of which are in hellfire except one. So when he was asked about this one group, he said, It is the one which sticks to what I and my companions are sticking to now or today. You see, he, did, he didn't say it's the group which intends good, that's all. Or it is the group which fights only. Or it is the group which makes a lot of prayers. Huh? The Sheikh says, that's why Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah has been described to be the saved group, Al Firqatun Naji. The Prophet وسلم, testified for them that they will be saved when he mentioned that this nation will divide into 73 groups, all of which are in hellfire except one. And when he was asked about this one group, he said, it is the one which is upon that which I and my companions are upon now. He did not say it is the group which means to do good, no matter how it wants to do this good, no. He did not say it is the group which keeps fighting, no matter what deviation it might have. He did not say it is the group which seeks to establish the Islamic State, no matter what they believe in. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ said, no. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ said. And the Sheikh says, therefore, what the Prophet ﷺ has foretold happened. Because some people, when they wished to build their aqidah on other than the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, like the knowledge of Kalam, talk, and like the rules of what they call logic and philosophy and so on, a lot of deviations has occurred by choosing other than the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, and a lot of differences has occurred in their uh, beliefs. 
and therefore they became fighting one another and against one another and one group splits and the whole society collapses the third chapter regarding the deviations from the aqidah and how to save one's self from such deviations the deviations from the true aqidah is a great loss and destruction as the sheikh says because the true aqidah is the dynamo the greatest motive to the right actions and to the righteous actions for someone to be without the true aqidah then he will be an easy prey for all the illusions and the doubts which build up on his mind and therefore block his vision his true vision from seeing what causes the happy life and things become so narrow and tight to him that no matter how he tries to get rid of such narrowness and what is based on it of feeling bad in his heart it will be very difficult for him to get rid of all that he has to commit suicide sometimes in order for him to get rid of the bad feelings which come as a result of the wrong faith as is the situation nowadays with the kafir people and many others who lose the guidance of the true aqidah and for a society not to have the true aqidah then it is like an animal's society which has no foundation of happy life even if they have a lot of the materialistic support in this life but they are still missing what is more important as we see in the kafir societies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O oh messengers eat of that which is good only and act righteously so if you don't act righteously then you don't live happily you don't live happily just by eating but you live happily by eating and doing righteous things and eating is not a goal it's a means towards doing righteous things because you take the strength from eating and sleeping and so on those are means of course the strength is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but those are means but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just say in quran eat good things no he said eat good things and do righteous actions because this is the goal of the muslim in this life to do righteous actions and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about dawood that we have provided him great provision o mountains be submissive to dawood and also the birds be submissive to him meaning allah said to the mountains and to the birds you should be submissive and supportive to dawood alayhi salam and we made the iron very easy for him to shape very easy for him to shape so that he makes whatever he wants from them and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said after that wa'malu saliha inni bima ta'maluna basir so i have given you all those means which you could use in your life so that you act righteously you do the righteous actions tawhid prayers siyam salat zakat hajj ordering the good forbidding the evil being good to the parents being good to the relatives and so on and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about sulaiman and what he provided him with of great things like making the winds submissive to him he can control the winds and order them to do what he wants 
and many other things like making the jinn serve him and be servants and slaves for Sulaiman. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, after he mentioned all those bounties to Sulaiman, who was the son of Dawood, he said, اعملوا آل داود شكرا وقليل من عبادي الشكور So, we gave you all this. Therefore, be thankful to Allah by acting upon his orders, acting the right action. And this is the real thanking. The real thanking is to act. Many people nowadays, unfortunately, find it very easy to say, Alhamdulillah, we have such and such and this and this, but you find no action at all. Even prayers, they don't pray. Even fasting, they might not fast. They deal with riba, they deal with haram things. And they think the only way to thank Allah is by tongue. And, and you find them indulged into sins from, as they say, from toe to top, huh? from their foot to their heads. They are immersed in sins and haram things. And yet they say, praise be to Allah. But those people are tested. Upon uh, any hardship, they would curse Allah. And they would say bad things because they are not true believers. Yeah, I mean, when, they, when they are relaxing and they have everything they want and all that, it's easy for them to say, thank Allah, alhamdulillah, we have this, we have that. But they are not thanking by action. They have no limits for haram and halal. They do what they think is beneficial for them. So the power of aqidah cannot be separated from the materialistic strength. Because if it is separated by going to the false aqidah, then the materialistic strength will be a means of destruction, as it is seen clearly nowadays in the kafir countries, who have the materialistic strength but do not have the true aqidah. And the deviation from the true aqidah has many reasons. They should be known. One of the most important is the ignorance about the true aqidah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to learn, saying, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Learn, لا إله إلا الله. Because it needs to be learned. Umar رضي الله عنه said, the branches of Islam will be subject to destruction one by one. If there comes people who do not know the deviations that are around them or that have occurred before them. Yani if you don't know shirk, you will fall into it. If you don't know what your salat is yani, going to be nullified if you do, then you are going to nullify your salat also. If you don't know what are the things which are contradictory to fasting, you will fall into them. You think you are fasting, but you are not fasting, and so on. So, the first thing is the ignorance about the true aqidah, caused by not seeking to learn it or teach it. Because if you learn it by yourself, you have to teach it to others as much as you can. Otherwise, they will be ignorant about the true aqidah. And being ignorant about it means also that you don't know what opposes to it or what is contradictory to it. And then he quoted the saying of Umar radiallahu an that I mentioned. The second cause of deviation is the blind following of what the fathers and ancestors were upon. This is a great cause of deviancy. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran, if they were told, follow that which Allah has revealed, they would say, no, we would rather follow what we have inherited from our fathers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how could they do this if their fathers 
were not knowing the truth and they were not guided to the truth. This is 170 Surah Al-Baqarah. So to stick strongly and hold firmly to what the fathers were on, this is one of the great causes of deviation. And the third is the blind following of anyone, whether the fathers or other than the fathers. And to take any belief from someone without a proof, this is a cause of ignorance and a cause of deviation in Aqidah. Like all the groups which went astray in Aqidah, Jahmiyyah, Mu'tazilah, Asha'ira, Sufiyyah and others, they are blind followers of their predecessors. They are blind followers. Yani if you come across any writing by any person who follows, let's say, Ash'ariya or whatever, and you find his writing, compare it to the old Ash'aris, 600 years ago, 700 years ago, you would find the same thing. The same thing. So they are blind followers and they have nothing more to add. The fourth cause is the exaggeration in loving the pious people and putting them above their degree which they deserve. This has been the cause for committing shirk in the past nations. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the people of Nuh. When they exaggerated in loving some pious people, they worshipped them later on. And like the Sheikh says, like what is happening from the grave worshippers today in many countries. And the fifth is to be unaware of understanding the signs and verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be fooled by the glare of the materialistic civilization to the degree that they think that everything is under the control and ability of humans. So they, they would put the humans in a very high rank, maybe the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about Qarun when he said, إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي That I have been given all this fortune because of my knowledge. Because of my knowledge. And this is verse 78, Surah Al-Qasas. And they did not actually think and look around them to see the greatness of creation and the greatness of the Creator who found all those and who created all those and who found the humans and who gave him the capability to derive all those things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amalu. He has created you and your actions. All that which you do are his creation. So you cannot think that you are doing things without the will of Allah or without the ability of Allah to stop you and things like that. And the sixth point, the Sheikh says, most of the Muslim houses nowadays are empty from the correct direction. The Prophet ﷺ said, everyone is born on the natural instinct which Allah has created him with. So his parents might lead him to Judaism or Christianity or so on. This is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. So the parents have a great role in correcting the path of the child. The seventh is that the means of education and information in most of the Islamic countries do not do their job of proper teaching. So most of the curriculums, educational curriculums, do not give يعني, a weight to teaching the correct religion. Sometimes they, they don't care about teaching the right religion and the right values at all. As a matter of fact, they care about teaching 
the false values deliberately and how to avoid those means first by going back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take the true faith from them as our predecessors based their aqidah on them only and as Imam Malik rahimahullah said nothing will be useful towards the end of this nation except that which was useful in the beginning of this nation meaning what the Prophet sallam and his companions were upon also one has to be aware of the deviations around him he knows that this is a deviation and this is a deviation so that he does not fall into it as the companions used to do radiallahu anhum they said that i was asking the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about evil as a precaution for myself so that i don't fall into it so this is a very smart way that the Muslim should be aware of the deviations around him. Enough to save him. Enough to make him avoid those deviations. Yani we don't mean that one, one's main concern should be following the deviations and looking into all what they say and this and that. No. This is a destruction and this will make you this will make you miss a lot of duties that you have to do. And the second point is to teach the true aqidah, the aqidah of the predecessors, the salaf, in all stages of studying and to give those lessons of aqidah the enough time. And the third is that we should be very picky about the books that they should be purely Salafi books and be aware of the books which are written by deviated people like Sufis, Innovators, Jahmis, Mu'tazila, Asha'ira, Matridiya and others except for special people who want to know what's in those books in order to refute them and to reply on them and the fourth is that some people should be devoted to bringing alive to the people the right aqidah and to refute the astray ways.